All right, so I'm here at the DevNexus conference. We're doing night hacking interviews with different speakers and folks um, at the venue here. And I'm joined by Mr. Venkat Subramaniam. And congratulations on your Lambdas book, Thank which you. is now released. Um, I believe it's in O'Reilly? Uh, Pragmatic Programming. Pragmatic Programming Press title. What's yeah. the title of your book again? Uh, Functional Programming with Java 8. Functional programming with Java 8, so highly recommended. I think I read your pre-release version you sent over. Okay. It was very good. Um, and I was thinking, since we're, we're here, we have about 15 minutes, maybe we could do some live coding and look at some things which you're interested in. Sure. Well, I'm going to talk about one small thing. And I actually ran into this yesterday. And uh, it took me a little while to actually arrive at this particular answer, which I've used before, but sometimes it's not obvious. I come from the object-oriented and imperative style of programming world, so it's a mind shift to really start thinking in a functional style. So I'm going to make a, a, a statement, and then I'm going to back it up with uh, an example. Okay. And, and the statement I'm going to make here is that consider using lambdas in place of inheritance. Hmm. And of course, this doesn't apply widely for every single use of inheritance, but, but I'm going to look at one specific example where we have used inheritance in the past, but I think lambdas are much better. So, so that's basically what I'm going to talk about now. Cool. No, I'm, I'm interested now. You got my attention. All right. <laughs> so, so let's look at one example. One thing we often want to do is to compare a couple of different algorithms. Mm -hmm. and one often comparison I would like to make is timing. Is one performing better than the other? I also do this quite a bit when I try to use maybe a sequential versus a parallel, and I want to know what the real difference is. Yeah. Uh, there are times when one may actually be better than the other. Sometimes it's not. So I'm going to keep it extremely simple. Let's say I just have a task I want to measure the time for. But I do have multiple tasks, and there's quite a bit of commonality. Especially when it comes to measuring time differences, it's extremely important to keep the code as similar as possible. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write a, a method, let's say, in this case, let's start with a little you know, method to measure the time, if you will. So let's start with, um, let's say, um, void time op. And I'm mm -hmm. going to perform a time operation. And what I want to do here, of course, is let's say I'm going to say um, start. And this is going to simply be um, a nano time. So just measure the you know, current time when we start an operation, measure the end time when we finish the operation. Yep. And I'm just going to go ahead and print the time difference. So very simple code to begin with. And given this particular operation, I want to know what operation I want to perform. So this is where I want to do the real operation. Now, typically, I want to use the sa same code but I want to be able to vary two different implementations. So our initial target for this is to use inheritance, because with inheritance is the pathway to get polymorphism in a lot of languages like Java, so we tend to use that. So what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to say base instance, and, and within this, I'm going to simply say output instance dot, let's say, work. So I'm going to call some work method send a data. Mm -hmm. Well, this could be a complex data you send, could be a complex result you get back, but the essence is you're capturing all that commonality right here within this code. So of course, I want to make this work. So what I'm going to do here is to simply call time up, and I'm going to say new base, and this could be the base algorithm that we're going to send. So given the instance, we can call the work on that and get the work done. Yeah, so, it feels like this is code I've written before. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. We all have done this in Java. So, so if I have this work method, let's say I have a public int work, and that's going to take some input. It doesn't really matter what the input is. And I'm going to simply say call a sleep method to give a little delay for this you know, uh, a hypothetical computation. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to return just the input as if it finished some really wonderful work and gives us a result. Now, of course, I need the time method, so a sleep method. So let's go ahead and write that. So that's going to be uh, my sleep, and it's going to take a millisecond uh, time difference. And I'm going to simply say, you know, thread.sleep here. And let's go ahead and say that's going to be the milliseconds we give, and of course, the infamous catch block for that. So um, we're done. So given this, 
if I would to, were to run this little code, assuming I didn't make any syntax errors in here, mm -hmm. this should give us the time it takes to execute this little piece of code. So, so that's basically what we are looking at here. Oh, well, it took about, you know, it says nine seconds or so, I'm not sure why, a thousand, so uh, maybe I did a mistake in the measurement. But anyway, it gives us some time and uh, gives us the end result of executing that little code. But how do we really measure the time for an alternate implementation? So the initial you know, design we would normally do is a derived class. And then, of course, the idea behind this is that we would override the method in the derived class. So I call this a pretty heavyweight approach because we create a derived which extends from the base. But in this case, of course, we're going to go ahead and provide an alternate implementation of that, whatever that variation could be. Yep. So, so this is a typical solution we normally reach out to. And then we can see that it's going to run two different implementations in this particular case for us to be able to use that. Yeah, so I think, yeah. did, you, uh, did you mean this to be an exponent? Uh, there we go. What did I do? On point uh, OE9, right? Yeah. So there we go. Thank you. That's the problem. Always helpful to have somebody <laughs> next to you who can look at what you're doing wrong. All right. So, uh, so that gives us an idea about how we can measure the time that it takes. And clearly, one is faster than the other. Yep. But we clearly used inheritance as the and polymorphism as the design choice. But I think we can do a lot better than this. Yeah, it feels like it was kind of a, a forced design choice because we didn't really have any other tools at our disposal to simply swap in a different implementation. That's correct. So, so what I'm going to do here is, first of all, I'm going to re-implement this code into the same class we are in. And I'll call this as work one, mm -hmm. essentially an algorithm one. Likewise, I'll take this implementation we have here and I'll bring this here. And it doesn't have to be a separate method, but it just makes it easy if they are two separate methods. So with that said, we can get rid of that heavyweight, totally unnecessary class that we were reaching into. But that still leaves the question, how are we going to measure the time? Well, rather than using inheritance, what I would like to do here is simply provide a function. So in this case, I'm passing an integer. Now, it could be something else, depending on the complexity of the problem. This could be a list. This could be another object. Doesn't really matter. Yep. Function is pretty versatile to accept just about anything and return just about anything. And then I'm going to call this as the work. And so essentially, we're going to turn this around from a call on an object to an invocation of a little function. So in, the, in other words, rather than passing, so, so in a way, if you really think about it, um, this is really funny. If you think about what we did a few minutes ago, we created an object, or rather a class, and then that class only had one method. So in a way, we've been treating functions like they are kindergarten children. They come over and say, could I go to the neighborhood park, please? You say, no, sweetie, you cannot go alone. We, you need an adult to go with you. And then we've been <laughs> wrapping this within objects. Well, we, finally, that's, it's like you know, functions grew up, and 18 years later, they have the freedom to go on their own. That's, that's a good analogy. So, so <laughs> as a result, we can pass the functions directly. So in this case, if you I, notice. I definitely, I, I kick my daughter to school. She walks. <laughs> by herself. So, so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and pass to this one. Uh, simply given a value, I'm going to first of all call the work1 method, which we are, which have on our hands. So this is going to be work1. And I'm going to pass the same result to it. We'll just start with this first. And we'll come back to the other implementation in just a minute. Yep. Of course, this requires a function. So we'll go ahead and bring in a function dot function here. So that gives us the function interface um, reference to it. So, so what we are doing in this case is we are passing, in this case, a context. Of course, I better make this a static method because we are in the static context. Had we had an object, we could be in the instance con uh, context. So in fact, this is even more specifically says we clearly are not employing polymorphism here because static methods cannot be polymorphic. So, so we can see that in this particular case, we wrote it that way. But we can also do one more thing. But before we look at another example, let's quickly take a look at this for a minute. So if you notice, we did not use classes, extra classes at all. We used a functional interface, which is a function. We're passing a function, and then we are saying, we're going to do stuff, but right in the middle of measurement, we're going to go ahead and call the function we are interested in. Mm -hmm. So this can make it a lot more concise as well. So we could, for example, in this case, say sample and then call work to, so we could even use a method reference. So as a result, we no longer have to pass a lambda 
We could even pass a method reference, but in this case, of course, because it was a simple route through. We could also fully put a Lambda expression here to do the actual work if it was mm -hmm. a very small piece of work. But typically, if it's a typical algorithm, you wouldn't put the algorithm in this case. You would be calling into it. So this is something that really drew my attention because I was trying to do something yesterday where I really had to get a time uh, performance. And my first reaction was to go start using inheritance. And then, in fact, I, I went that route. And I was not happy at all. It was becoming bulky, more code to write. It also gave me trouble with, oh, how do I really instantiate this other object, coupling between objects? And then suddenly yeah, I realized. Yeah, no, I, I think the other thing I've noticed is once I've created a class as an abstraction to simply um, create different implementations of the same behavior, I tend to attach more meaning to it yep. than I would otherwise. So the class becomes very heavyweight. That's right. In the system, as opposed to a kind of a lightweight um, drop-in object. Yeah. So, um, so this function. actually hinges on uh, a fairly interesting pattern. This is a variation of the pattern we have used here, but a very similar code structure like this, I'm beginning to see more and more evolve when it comes to uh, functional uh, style of programming, especially in Java 8. And the idea behind this is you have some operation you want to perform, but you want to do something before, and you want to do something after. Mm -hmm. Well, this is not new in Java, because if you really think about it, Way back in time, we actually had this in Java. So you would say, for example, synchronized. And the minute you say synchronized some object, let's say OBJ, and if you really think about it, this pattern has been around in Java for a very long time. What does synchronized do? Well, synchronized gives you a, pretty much gives you a lock, crosses the memory barrier. And then once you are within the block of code to do whatever you want to do here, and the minute you leave the block of code, it automatically releases the lock and crosses the memory barrier again. But, but the same essential pattern, except. Yeah, so that was a pattern which was not really accessible to developers Bingo. to change the behavior of. That's correct. So, so now it's like democracy and freedom. Yeah, this kind of reminds me of, I don't know if this is still a thing, but back a while ago, there was this aspect-oriented programming deal where you put point cuts and like have things happen before and after methods. And right. it was very, I don't know detached from the code in a lot of ways. It was hard to figure out what your code was doing, whereas Lambdas gives you a direct way of passing in the logic, which you'd like to encapsulate. That's a great example to, to think about. That's a great way to think about a paradigm there. So, so it is an aspect, except we don't have to use, you know, I'm going to say heavyweight tools that give us the aspect injection. Yeah. This becomes more of a um, hygienic syntax in the language. It's very expressive. It's easy to see. And so, so that's essentially the concept we have used here, is to simply take that synchronized and then make that more available for just about any operation we want to perform. And so even though the intent here is not exactly the same, this hinges on the so-called execute around method pattern. And the idea behind execute around method is you got some code, but around that you want to execute something. Mm -hmm. but, but what you execute is entirely up to you. It could be a timing like this. You want to measure the timing and measure the time afterwards. It could be an initialization of a resource and cleaning of the resource. It could be a starting of a transaction and ending of a transaction. So this pr pr pattern, I think, is pretty versatile. We can carry it through just about anything we want to do. And the way we would write the code for it is absolutely no different than that structure. So I think that's pretty um, ubiquitous in a way that we can apply this for very cool. number of things. All right, so you fulfilled my expectations. I learned something exciting today. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Um, so thanks very much for joining us on Night Hacking at the DevNexus conference. Um, you have a session coming up here? Yep, I've got three talks here. Three talks, yep. OK. Mostly on lambdas. Very nice. And then um, let's, let's give a quick plug. Where else in the world will we see you coming up soon? A lot of places. <laughs> a lot of places. <laughs> okay, we won't go down your entire travel schedule. So, yeah. thank you very much, man. For sure, thank you. Appreciate it.